Okay, so we've been told we have to begin and end on time, so we're beginning <laughs> three minutes late. Um, <laughs> um, we've been asked to give you a few reminders. Cell phones, please put them off or on silent, the, not just for politeness, because, but because the session's being taped. Um, and we're supposed to turn ours off, too. <laughs> um, it says if audience members would like to tweet about the session, ACS's Twitter handle is at ACS Law, and the 2017 National Convention's official hashtag is uh, hashtag ACS2017. Um, if you want CLE credit, um, you have to sign in with the staff at the table right outside the room. Um, there is a microphone somewhere for questions. Someone is running around with it, yeah. So if you raise your hand, she will bring it to you. Um, again, we need the questions on the mic because of the video. <coughs> um, we welcome your questions at any time. We're not gonna wait. We don't want you to wait and ask your questions at the end. Ask it when it's pertinent or when it occurs to you. <laughs> Hopefully it's the same thing. Um, so we're going to talk to you for a really long time about the Freedom of Information Act. Um, as you, for us, FOIA is something we sort of have in the back of our minds all the time. So as we listen to the Comey hearings, we wonder, can we FOIA for the memos? When we read about what Scott Pruitt at the EPA is doing these days, we wonder if we can ask for his uh, communications with the Chamber of Commerce, or can we FOIA for his daily calendar? Um, a lot of the things that you might wish you could see as you read the newspaper, you can't get. A fair amount you can, um, assuming the agency will actually go through and process your request. So um, we're going to go through the nuts and bolts of how you use FOIA and again, ask questions at any time, and then we'll spend some time talking about um, requests that people have asked us to do over the past, primarily over the past six months, um, and invite you to talk through with us uh, why we might have sent that request in or not, and what we might expect to get back. Um, I guess I jumped in without saying I'm Allison Zeev. I'm director of Public Citizen Litigation Group. Public Citizen has been in the forefront of FOIA litigation uh, since the early 70s. Wow. <laughs> and I thought it was really loud already. Um, uh, and I've been there since the mid-90s. Oh, we've litigated FOIA questions at all levels of the federal judiciary. Not, there are state FOIAs, which we don't use so much and we're not going to talk about today. Um, and this is Rachel. Yeah, my name is Rachel Clattenberg, and I worked for Allison until about a month with. ago with Allison. <laughs> um, and I did, um, I was at Public Citizen Litigation Group, and I focused on FOIA as well. So let's get started. Um, as Allison said, we're talking about the Federal Freedom of Information Act. There are also state public records laws, but we will not be covering those today. So there are four kind of principles that make FOIA work. The first is the presumption in favor of public access to government records. So there's a presumption in favor of disclosure underlying the act. The second one is that the statute is supposed to be easy to use. It's accessible. You don't need an attorney to file. You don't need a reason to ask for the records. You don't have to justify why you're asking for the records. The third is that there are uh, nine categories of, of information that the government does not have to disclose, but if it doesn't fall within those, they have to disclose it, and it's the government's burden to show that any information they want to withhold falls within one of those nine exclusive categories. And finally, what gives the law its teeth is that it, you can sue to enforce FOIA in federal court. So FOIA is, this is just, this is as easy as it is. It's just a letter and you're describing the records that you want and they need to be agency records. And you also need to address fees and we're not going to go that much into fees, but just 
be aware that um, there can be fees for the requests. Uh, so uh, as to the record, sometimes it's an email. For, for a while, all the agencies were allowing requests by email, and some have a portal, uh, like a form to fill in on their website where you can just plug in your request. Um, so it's a very, the requesting part is a very informal process. Um, the description also doesn't need any fancy legal or special terms. You need to describe it clearly enough that the agency knows what it is you're asking for. Um, that's, that's to your benefit and theirs. Um, and do we cover this later? The agency yeah. records means not um, presidential records. So the president is, oh, we get to that, is not covered by FOIA. So if you um, wanted to FOIA for um, uh, Donald Trump's tapes, it would be just outside the scope. It's not even exempt. It's just not covered by the statute. Um, the ju judicial records are not covered by FOIA and congressional records. There's actually no um, open access to any congressional records. Um, the judicial records, you know, you get what's in the court's file. Do you want to do the other? So the, yeah, and also just on the agency records, the, it's also distinguished from personal records. Um, and there's been some cases on this. So for instance, the appointment calendars of senior agency officials, if they're being used by other people in the agency, even if they have personal appointments on them are agency records, but ones that are not relied on or used by anyone else in the agency have been found to be personal records not subject to FOIA. So that's another area where agency records come in. Um, but if uh, someone at an agency is using their federal email for personal communication, all their personal communications are agency records. They might wind up being exempt for some reason or just never come within the scope of a FOIA request because where they want to go to dinner with their friends on Friday night is probably not something that you would request. Um, but uh, they are actually agency records, um, which, also, which means they're potentially subject to FOIA as well as the Federal Records Act, which is something that we could have talked to Hillary Clinton about a few years ago, but uh, it's moot now. Right, and on the flip side, if they're using a personal email account to conduct agency business, those are also agency records. So any person can request, <coughs> that includes corporations, that includes states, it does not, other agencies can't request. Foreign citizens are also permitted to file for requests, but not foreign governments. So this is a kind of a, just an overview of the FOIA process, just briefly, because so you can see you're submitting a proper request, you get an acknowledgement from the agency. This is how it's supposed to work. <coughs> uh, you're supposed to get a response uh, in less than 20 or within 20 working days. And if not, you've constructively exhausted, you could sue at that point. Then hopefully they send you their determination. You can appeal. And again, they have 20 working days to um, respond. And then after they issue their final decision, you can sue then again. So you can't sue without appealing, an administrative appeal, which again is a letter. Um, there's no special format for it. And in your appeal, you don't have to set forth all the legal arguments. It's, it is an exhaustion requirement, but you don't, if you fail to make a particular legal argument in your appeal, it, it doesn't mean you've waived it for when you later sue. Um, likewise, if the government's response doesn't make a particular argument, they haven't waived it. So they sometimes waive exemption, uh, raise exemptions in a lawsuit that they did not raise at the administrative level. This little chart makes it look a little complicated, but it's, it's not. You're sending in a letter, you're waiting for a response. If you don't like it, you send in another letter. You wait for the response. Um, the 20 day thing is, um, is a statutory requirement, but it's really aspirational. It's, uh, it's rare to get a response within 20 days. The substantive response, you get an acknowledgement, but you're not really gonna get your response within 20 days. They can by law always take a 10 day extension. They always do. And then 
for many, many requests. They take many more months after that. We got a request this week, from a response this week from something we had sent in in December, and I thought that seemed fairly prompt for them. It, it depends agency by agency, and whether your request is really straightforward or not. The more, uh, the more material that they might want to redact from it because it's exempt, the longer it will take. Um, the appeals usually go faster because they usually deny them so the work has already been done at the, at the stage of the first determination. Um, but occasionally, if it, an appeal is taking a while and then it turns out it's because what we get in response to the appeal is the information that we requested originally. So to go into a little bit about drafting the actual request language, um, as we said before, they need to be, needs to reasonably describe the records and agencies do not have to respond to questions. So do you have any records on, you know, if you're, what, that's not right, but can you send me, I can't think of a good example of a question, how you would ask, but you can't, they don't well, respond to questions. Why did Scott Pruitt decide to do X? Yeah. Exactly. It's not interrogatories, it's a document request. Or if you ask like how many times did such and such happen, if that would require them to compile a bunch of things for you and figure that out, they don't have to answer that question. Um, they also don't have to create records. Sometimes they do create a chart and send it to you, but they don't have to. Um, one um, type of request that relates to this that we've been having some trouble with recently is uh, databases. Um, we have a client who for many years had asked one of the agencies for certain fields from a database that has a ton of fields and they were uh, producing those fields. <coughs> but recently they've said that producing a fields from a database as opposed to the whole thing is creating a record. And so now they've stopped doing it. Um, I think we might have had another case where this happened once and we already won against another agency a few years ago. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we found it, we've found too many times that uh, the little issues with FOIA, not like the big things, not the issues that go to the Supreme Court, but lots of smaller issues, um, they keep coming around again. So we win and then 10 years later, they do it again. Um, and that's one of the things that's happening with this database thing. So I expect we'll win again, but we had to file a lawsuit yesterday. And then the final thing here is that maybe Allison might have a different view on, but determining how specific you want to be, I think it's better to be as narrow as possible because you can always go back and it's more likely that you'll get a response, I think, quicker if you're not too broad. But then again, you also risk missing out on some information. I don't disagree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the next couple things are ways you can um, get ideas for your request language and, and also ideas for what to ask for because one of the hard parts about drafting a request is figuring out what records an agency actually has that you can ask for. A lot of times people ask for emails, but emails are often exempt under some exemptions we'll talk about later. And there might be other records that have the information you want, so it'd be nice to know what records agencies have. So one one resource I like is um, muckrock.com, and I'm scared to click on this link in case we never get back here. You think it'll work? Should we try, Let's it? try it? Okay. <laughs> oh, we can. All right. Never mind. We're not connected to the internet. Um, <laughs> but if you go to muckrock.com, you can search um, a database of FOIA requests that they have had submitted through them. And you can see, it's nice because you can see the request, you can see the acknowledgement, you can see any other correspondence they've had with the agency. And you can see the types of records that people request from different agencies. You can filter it by agency and you can filter it by jurisdiction, so federal or state. <coughs> Another good place to look is in news articles. So this was a Bloomberg article from a couple years ago. And in it, it said, that Ingersoll Rand, which is a um, government contractor, provided this, a memo to Bloomberg News 
on the condition that it not publish the document and that the news organization drop an effort to obtain it through public records request. So someone at Public Citizen saw this and said, wait a second, <laughs> we want to get a copy of that memo. Um, so we FOIA'd it, we ended up suing on it, um, but, it, and we got it. So this is just another way to figure out what kinds of things you want to request. This was sort of in, this was like, this was ridiculously easy for us. They basically, <laughs> the sentence basically says this is an exempt from FOIA, but we didn't want you to, but we wanted to keep it confidential. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you're drafting the request, if you want to figure out a way to narrow what you have, you can think about narrowing it by a date range um, to have them search just with, for documents within specific dates. You can give them keywords. You can also reference n events in news articles. Um, you know, I, I want something on this this you know meeting that I read about in the New York Times on such and such a date. Um, and you can name the people involved in any of the records or emails. They can deny requests as overly broad if they are unduly burdensome to search for. But this is quite. It has to be quite burdensome. Um, based on the case law. So for example, one that was the court upheld as overly broad was a page by page search through 84,000 cubic feet of documents. So that sounds like a lot. And some a request where they asked for uh, all the records about a particular person from all of the IRS's offices, which is also sounds very broad. Um, the agency will also often call you, I find, and say, as an initial communication that your request is too broad, but you don't have to accept that. That doesn't mean it's too broad and by the court <coughs> standard. Um, they often, I found that a lot recently was they would call and say, you have to name specific people. And uh, I don't think that's always true. You don't have to always name specific people, either at the corporation, for instance, who you want records with the agency from and, or at the agency itself. So uh, each um, administration seems to have a different FOIA personality. So <laughs> during the Bush administration, they just didn't pay a lot of attention. They were painfully slow. During the Obama administration, they tried to come up with clever legal arguments that would impede the use of FOIA for all time. And fees. Uh, and they went a lot on fees. And in this administration, they're just saying things that are just flatly wrong that causes a lot of delay. So for instance, calling and insisting that you have to narrow your request when you have a perfectly narrow request, right? All, all emails from Scott Pruitt to uh, Murray Energy in the month of February. Well, that's just so broad. Oh, like, they say, no, no, they say you have, to name, you have to name the officials at Murray Energy. They will say something like that. You have to name the officials at the, at the company. Like, no, just search for the ones that are at MurrayEnergy.com. There was one where they called and asked Rachel to narrow it, which was ridiculous, but what they talked her into was broadening it. Yeah. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I do recommend when they call you to initially find out what they suggest. So I always ask, like, okay, well, well, okay, but well, what do you think would be a better request? And a lot of times what, they're, what they suggest is actually like a lot more information. So ask them what they, how they would write it. Um, so they've done that in a few ways. Recently, we had a we asked for fee waivers, um, public interest groups and um, or non-commercial requesters and members of the news media can get a request of a waiver of the search and uh, copying fees. And they recently wrote us and said something was just totally wrong. So it wasted time. And they said they couldn't grant our fee waiver request because of this. So it wasted our time. <clears throat> and we responded by giving them the case law that shows they were totally wrong. So they weren't actually trying to make new law. And they weren't slow walking the request, which wasn't very old at all. It was a couple weeks old. Um, but they're just saying crazy stuff. I don't know if they're all new or if they've been told that one way to slow everything down is to just say things that are flatly wrong so that we have to engage in more correspondence. Yep. Just a, a quick question, are the, the calls you're getting, is that because you are a public citizen and you have a history of suing them over FOIA denials or is that something that is likely to happen no matter who you are or what organization you're with? Uh, I think it's likely to happen. Um, it's not like the particular FOIA staff person would necessarily know us for each agency. Yeah. Um, I 
think they, one reason they call is probably because if they call a requester with less experience using FOIA, they probably, that call probably does help them to, help the FOIA staff person to cut down their work. <laughs> um, but it's not just us. And when we, when someone out in the community calls us and asks us a question about FOIA, this is happening, what do I do? We always tell them to call. Like, you've been waiting three months, you haven't anything, just call and ask them. Um, so they're used to talking to, to requesters other than us. Um, <laughs> so then you, once you have your request, you have to figure out how to send it in and also which agencies to send it to. Remember, you can send it to as many as you want. Um, so if you can't figure out which agency might have the records, which I think is sometimes hard, for instance, when you're trying to find, um, trying to remember one of the ones we were looking for, but records about um, the costs of some of Trump's trips and travel, it's kind of hard to figure out where you would send all those um, because you don't know who else. Is it, is it GSA? Is it Secret Service? Um, this FOIA.gov link Ha they have a pretty good tool right now. You can click on the department, so for instance, Department of Defense, and then from within that they have all the agencies, sub-agencies, and they give you the request um, information. Some agencies use this online portal called FOIA Online, and it would be great if every agency did, but they don't. So some agencies, you go through that, and you have to make an account, of course, um, other agencies have their own portal. My favorite way to do it is to PDF and email it. But more and more, they seem to be taking away the email option. And you have to do various different ways. You can always do mail. Um, or some of them still do fax. Uh, but, and some of, the, some of the online portals, I start filling them out. And I realize they're, they're requiring you to agree that you'll pay a certain amount of minimum fees and I want a fee waiver so and they don't give you that option so then I have to go back and just mail it in so you'll it's a little bit annoying <laughs> but also look at each agency's regulations on FOIA when you are submitting your request just to make sure you've ticked all the boxes could I just ask a question about the online portal so when you submit through an online portal what kind of record do you get that you've submitted or you know do you need screen caps or like what 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 do you do to document the timing so they will Usually you get an immediate response, uh, an immediate receipt. That is not the official acknowledgement, but that does give you, you know, you did submit this. Then a few days later, a week later, two weeks later, you should get an email from the agency. Some of them are automated and some, are, some of them are the actual acknowledgement, but it'll be an email. But you should know promptly that your, your request went through, if that's what you mean. Yes, if you don't get like some sort of like a page, you know, you hit click and then you get a receipt on the actual internet or something in your email, then it, I don't think it went through. Uh, this is just what an acknowledgement letter looks like, just so you have some sense. This is the type of uh, letter you'll get after you send in a request. So generally, it, uh, it says it's acknowledging receipt and it will repeat your request. Um, you might have sent in a longer letter because you if you were asking for a fee waiver, sometimes our letters we repeat parts of the law saying things like you must, if, if, if the document is not entirely disclosable, then we request all segregable portions, stuff like that that is totally unnecessary. They don't repeat that. Um, but they will always include your request. It's nice to have as the acknowledgement um, so you know exactly which of your requests they're acknowledging. Um, but there's nothing special about it. They don't ever trick us there. They don't summarize. They're just quoting. Hi. Yeah, I wanted to go back to something you just said about agencies having regulations for the requests. What's the rationale for uh, agencies having agency-specific regulations to make a request? And in your experience, do certain agencies try to make the request process more burdensome than others? Um, for the most part, the regulations, like the heart of the regulations, are similar and seem unnecessary because they tell you how to do things that you would be doing anyway. Um, 
one purpose of the regulations is to talk about uh, how they're going to process different, uh, how their processing works. So, um, for instance, <laughs> um, this case, Open America, that we reference on the next slide, says that if the agency has a, uh, a decent process for going through requests and yet it's really backlogged, that when you sue and say it's, it's been four months and I don't have a request, the agency can get a stay. And what they have to do is say, well, we have a first in, first out policy and we process simple requests on one track and complex on another track and here's how we define simple and complex. And those things will, that processing and those definitions will be reflected in their regulations. Um, FDA has a regulation that it's had for a long time that does violate FOIA, we think, and does what you suggested of adding an extra hurdle, an extra step that is not authorized by the statute. I don't think that was, I don't think that's generally the intent of the regulations. Um, and FDA seems unable to comprehend that what they did is a problem. Um, but uh, it can be in there. Um, what else do they put in the regulations? So the, the, the place where I see differences is with the fees. They, break, they tend to break down the factors for justifying a fee request differently. Fee, a fee waiver. Fee waiver, sorry. Fee, fee waiver differently. So when you are writing the fee part, sometimes I just make sure that I've put it in the way they want. They, they, they are all asking the same six factors, but some of them make them three factors that combine a bunch. So I check out the fees, and I think their fee, their actual fees themselves differ and are in their regulations. Um, another type of regulation we've seen is, again, to talk about FDA, if, they, if you request information that they got from a third party, they have a regulation that says we're going to ask the third party what they think before we give it to you. Um, oh, yeah. So because, of the, because there's an exemption that might apply, which we'll talk about in a minute. So. Um, that actually sort of makes sense because the third party can sue them. So if the agency wants to give you something from a third party that the third party thinks is confidential, they can sue the agency to stop it. So they do need some notice. Um, so that process, that fact that they're always going to ask them and how long they'll give them, that's stated in a regulation. The <coughs> um, they amend their regulations from time to time, or CFPB had to draft all new regulations when it came into existence. And there's always some stuff in there we don't like, but it also doesn't, m doesn't make much difference to the processing. Yeah. Do this one? Yeah, so um, <coughs> we talked about the deadline. Allison said they, as they said, they, she said they almost always say we're taking 10 days for unusual circumstances. That's one of the things you'll see in the acknowledgement letter, and they just about always do it. So um, then the tolling, they can toll that 20-day period when they, when they call to ask you for more information. It's tolled. They can do that once. And also if they call to clarify about fees, it's also tolled until you send in your response and clarify that. So most... Most FOIA cases are filed in D.C., but not all. Um, and particularly in the past six months, FOIA is super popular, and we've heard a lot of people saying, I'm going to send in 10 requests a day. So this Open America case is there to... Um, uh, it, it's a way that whoever sues can't jump the queue if the agency is doing something, processing in a reasonable manner. So I can't sue... For, based on a request I submitted in January, and therefore get the court to say, well, they missed the deadline, they have to process Allison's request in the next 10 days, when there are 300 requests in the queue in front of, in front of me. Um, but Open America is also a reason that it's not a really good idea for everybody to send in 10 requests every day, because they can't all be that valuable. And the more the more requests there are, the slower the process is. So we don't send in 10 requests every day. Um, and we sometimes tell our, most of the requests, requests we send are for the um, for advocates, the lobbyists and researchers, the public citizen, as opposed to for the litigators. Um, and we'll say no to them sometimes. Like, you know, you've got, you have 20 requests pending before the FDA that are really important and you're gonna have another 
another 10 over the next four months, like, do you really want to clog it up with these requests? It's just, it's not good for anybody if we all are just sending in a bunch of not great requests because it slows the process. Um, that's not to say we don't send in a ton of requests. <laughs> and on that, just to, this is just one more thing they might ask you about when they call that I have found happened more um, with the new administration. And I think it's because so many people are sending in FOIA requests and they're sending in FOIA requests for the same things. So they may call and say, we have these other requests and this other request that are asking for these things. Can we just give you the records that are responsive to that one? Can we change yours slightly? And that's one of the ways I've gotten more information was because those other ones were a little bit broader, but because I was like, yeah, sure, just send me whatever they get in response to theirs. And they had already started processing that one. We got a response like that just this week. Yeah. Um, we'd asked for communications between the transition team and someone at the Department of Commerce. Um, we sent it in in December, and they had written to us after that, emailed and emailed Rachel and said, we've got this other request, it's the same, can we give you what we're processing for them? And they started giving us documents, in, including yesterday. And I think the request they're processing is a little broader than what we asked yeah, for. But not so broad that it's no longer useful to us, because if it were a lot broader, then it would just create more work for us and, and slow us down as we tried to figure out what in that 500 pages was really the 50 that we were interested in. Yep. Um, these were just some humorous headlines from Tech Dirt, which has great FOIA articles, by the way, um, <laughs> about agency deadlines, because this is the waiting is going to be the most frustrating part of the FOIA process for you. So these were real headlines. The State Department has taken over three years on a FOIA request about how long it takes to process FOIA requests. <laughs> and the CIA took three years to reject FOIA requests for criteria for rejecting FOIA requests. But that's, it is ha what it is. Like you're going to find, once you submit your request, you, you just you wait a really long time and you don't hear stuff. And that's kind of the hardest part. We have gotten some, um, from time to time we'll get a, letter that says we are we have this request from the year 2000 from Michael Tankersley who left my office in about the year 2000 <laughs> um, are you st you know it's now we're now turning to it are you still interested <laughs> like <laughs> I don't know what he was working on um, we do usually say no it's tempting to say yes but it's really unlikely that we're interested in something that a former colleague who's now been working for the government for a decade wanted, you know, two administrations ago, sadly. So um, while you're waiting, and, and you're not always waiting long, I um, did send in a request, actually it was two years ago now, that I got back with, I got the answer within 20 days, I got what I asked for. Um, so sometimes they actually do what the statute originally contemplated. Um, but you can always call and ask for an estimated date of completion. You can do it by email if you've had email communication, but we usually do it by phone. Um, people are often hesitant, hesitant to call the agency FOIA staff, but I never get the sense that they care. Um, so they'll call and say, you know, it's, it's June 10th, and they'll say we expect to get to it August 10th, and that might be frustrating, but at least you know. Um, and if you're considering suing, it's really helpful to know because we would never sue in June for something that is going to be processed in August. On the other hand, if we really wanted it and they said we're going to get to it next June, then our, our calculus about what to do next would be different. Um, and you can check in with the agency from time to time. They can tell you where it is in the queue. They can say that your number, your request is number 110. Um, <coughs> and then when you call back a few months later, three months later, you're 109, so you can see how it's going. <laughs> um, they sometimes call, as Rachel said, and ask you to modify the scope of the request. You can do that too, though, if you really want to. If they, if they say because of the breadth of your request, this is going to take us nine months, and there is a piece of it you're really most interested in, you can say, how about if we narrow it? So that negotiation can be um, initiated on either side. Um, you can agree to a rolling production. We've done that a bunch of times. Sometimes it c comes as part of the litigation as a way to 
settle the litigation, they'll agree to rolling production, whereas beforehand they were just going to not give you anything until everything was ready. But sometimes they'll suggest it when you're still at the agency stage. So if they say there's going to be a thousand documents and they all need to be reviewed because there's exempt material, um, then sometimes they'll agree to give you uh, 200 a month or something, uh, some schedule so that you're getting some satisfaction on a regular basis. And if they set a schedule, they'll probably keep to it or close to it. Um, <coughs> uh, what's that? You can also um, ask, so I don't know how often this has happened. I think one attorney in our office has done this. You can ask them to search first for, if you have a bunch of things you're requesting, you can pick a couple of them and say, can you search just for these and show me the records you get? I get send me the responsive records for those. And based on those, maybe I'll modify the rest of the request. And you don't have to search for all 50 different people yet. These are the two people I care most about. And then once you have given me those records, I'll see if I'm still interested in the others. Oh, I just wanted to say on the... Uh, I think it helps to, my understanding of how this FOIA processing works at an agency, because I think that helps when you're dealing with a delay, is the FOIA officer that you're talking to isn't actually, doesn't usually have the records in front of them that they're processing. What's usually taking a long time is they have to get the records from, you know, all these different places in the agency that, so some ag agency employee who has other work is also supposed to be searching their email, getting these records to the FOIA office. So the FOIA officer often doesn't ha just have the records sitting there waiting to be redacted. Um, but And I think they're often quite helpful, so I would I definitely encourage you to call them and kind of see. You can find out from them, I think. You get a better idea of do they have these records or are they waiting for somebody else. So this, um, which may be too much text for a PowerPoint, um, <laughs> is the sort of boilerplate that you'll see in the letter that the agency sends you when they're closing out the request. So they, they may have given you um, most of it or none of it, and at the end they have to tell you that you have a right to appeal and what the time is. Um, you're <coughs> you can't sue until you've appealed, and they can't say that you, your time has expired if they haven't told you what it is. Um, the FOIA regs for each agency do have different times for appeals. Some are 30, but some are 60. And they should always tell you in the letter. And they'll get it right. I don't, I don't think we ever double check them on it. Um, but <coughs> they're not all the same. And so um, you do want to read the letter carefully and make sure you don't blow the deadline. I think this kind of goes, and I'd uh, just add to that, the new, the, fo the amended FOIA statute was amended last year for requests filed at, one of the, um, one of the amendments was to make the appeal time frame the same for all agencies to be 90 days. So for requests that are filed after June 30th, 2016, the deadline is 90 days. Double check, make sure your letter says that, but they are eventually supposed to all have the same deadline. Okay, so um, what can you ask for and what can you get? Um, here's something we asked for. Yeah, so we're gonna just breeze through these. Research protocols for a NIH trial. These are consent forms um, for the same trial. Some policy memos. Inspection reports from the FBA about, FDA about um, American Red Cross blood banks. So those black splotches, those are theirs, not ours. Those are redactions. Usually they're needed. <laughs> <laughs> you can get contracts. This was a contract from the TSA for, uh, the TSA apparently used to have iPads that would randomly tell you which line, security line to go in, so it was a it just was an arrow that went left or right, and it was for some outrageous amount of money, which was what this contract was for. And on this one, there's a small red box in the middle. That's also a, um, a redaction, and it says in 
you probably guys maybe can't read it, um, but it it identifies which exemption they're um, invoking there when they redacted it, and that's more common. They're they're supposed to tell you which exemptions, so they don't usually just black things out without telling you. Um, consumer complaints. These are. I see a lot of these get requested. Um, this was to the DOT, and it was about an airplane seat that was uncomfortable, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> Another one, this is, I think these are uh, FCC ones. Yeah, FCC complaints are another popular request. So this was when Colin Kaepernick was doing his thing, and they, um, they have a bunch of people complaining about something that was said on the broadcast. Uh, these are just to show you that if you look in newspapers, you'll see that they rely on FOIA a lot. They often don't call it FOIA. They'll call it public records requests or something along those lines. But these are all articles from the past year or so that um, relied on records they got through FOIA. Actually, AP often mentions that it's FOIA, and AP sues a fair amount. And I think, actually, that the whole Clinton email thing came out because yeah. of a, came to light because of an AP request. More. There's more ones. So these things were all successful or FOIA requests that led them to led the agencies to redact. But then now we finally get to what you can't get. So there's nine exemptions, and this is how much they're used or how much they're invoked. Rather, um, the agency invoking a, an exemption doesn't mean they're right, but this is how much they use them. <coughs> Um, we know this because DOJ does an annual report. Each agency does an annual FOIA report, and it is posted online, so you don't have to FOIA for the FOIA report. And then DOJ does one. Um, the, what do they call it now? Office of Information and Privacy? Policy. Oh, policy. Office, Office of Information Policy. Uh, OIP within DOJ um, has, gives guidance to all the agencies about FOIA and compiles information. Um, and, and here you can see that over half of them are, well, we'll go through these, but exemption six and exemption seven C are the privacy exemptions. So those are the most heavily used. Okay, so I said there's nine, and um, the interesting, the ones that we're more interested in come earlier. We, we rarely talk about the later ones. So number one is information that's classified um, or um, uh, would release, would uh, sort of impede foreign policy, you can never get it. You can't argue your way out of it, and even if it seems ridiculous that this information is classified, they won't, an agency won't give it to you, and the court will never second guess it. Um, we asked for information once for, a, uh, we sued about information that was from the 1950s about some guy who was born in Britain and a Canadian national and the information we were asked this, this writer was asking for had to do with connections he had with Chiang Kai-shek the, the, uh, from China who doesn't, there isn't even a connection with the current Chinese government. There was just no reason this stuff had anything but historical interest, but it was classified. And so that was the end of it. We never got that. Um, exemption two was really supposed to be for like um, personnel, your personnel, an uh, individual's personnel file. Um, so their evaluations, their resume, like whatever was actually in the HR file. Um, but it also said and practices for a while. The government was, had what they called a low two and a high two. Low to was what it sounds like, sort of human resources stuff. And high to was other information an agency didn't want to give you that didn't fall under another exemption. <laughs> um, and they used it for years until the Supreme Court said no a few years ago. And sometimes it made sense. It was stuff you could see that maybe we shouldn't get, but it wasn't exempt. Um, so now they're actually using uh, one of the parts of Exemption 7 to try to accomplish the same thing. We'll get to those. Exemption 3 is information that is ex specifically exempt by f from FOIA by another statute, and it has to be explicit. So a statute that says 
information pursuant to the statute is not disclosable through FOIA. So it, it can't be implicit, it has to be an explicit exemption. And there's a lot of them, and there's a lot that are um, proposed in bills each year. Yeah, so like one of them is the National Security Act has one for intelligence sources and methods. It's a very strong one. The IRS, it doesn't, you know, you can't get someone's um, tax returns. That's an exemption three. Rachel currently has a case where a, a researcher who's writing about Eleanor Roosevelt asked for the FBI file on Eleanor Roosevelt, and they redacted a handful of pages from the from the 1950s saying it would reveal intelligence sources and methods. So we were sort of um, dismayed to hear that the FBI was still using the same intelligence sources and methods as in the <laughs> 1950s. Um, but we actually have an argument on that one. We've been waiting about a year to see what the judge thinks. <laughs> um, exemption four, that's trade secrets and confidential commercial information that was submitted by someone outside the government. Um, I alluded to this one when I was saying something about the FDA's um, uh, regulations. Um, a lot of agencies regularly get information from companies, uh, in particular, the FDA would or SEC would, um, actually a lot of them do. So if you want to see some of that information, um, you should be able to get it unless it's deemed confidential commercial information. Uh, the trade secrets doesn't, isn't, the definition of trade secrets isn't entirely the same as the Trade Secrets Act, but um, it's similar. And then confidential commercial information is broader. If an agency says, if a company can say, we never give this to anyone, um, it's considered confidential, even if there'd really be no harm. The DC Circuit has set up two tests um, for exemption four. If it was voluntarily submitted by a company, they didn't have to, but they offered it to the agency, and the company says to the agency, we consider this confidential, the agency just won't give it to you, and according to the DC Circuit, it falls under exemption four. Um, if it was not a voluntary submission, but but a mandated submission. Um, for example, the FDA companies have to submit um, reports about um, adverse um, events caused by, uh, side effects caused by their products or injuries caused by a medical device. Those are required submissions, so the test is a little more uh, friendly to the FOIA requester um, and they'd actually have to prove that, do you want to tell what they have to prove? Yeah, they either have to prove that it would, subs it would impair the government's ability to get that information in the future if they were to release it, or it would impair the quality of the information that that outside entity was submitting, or the alternative test is if it would uh, cause substantial competitive harm to that entity if that information was disclosed. So exemption four really comes down to is this voluntary submission or involuntary submission. If you if you if it's voluntary, you're not going to get it. Um, but the their definition of voluntary is not that. I, I wouldn't say it's the common use either, um, <laughs> because if you if if an entity chooses to partake or participate in a government activity and to participate in that, they have to submit certain information, that's an involuntary submission, even though it was they voluntarily participated. So for instance, bidding on a contract. But that's good for us. Which is good, it's good for FOIA requesters. That's, like, that's a good case. <laughs> so we've been thinking for a long time that we would like to um, convince the courts to drop this two-part test and, and, and have the exemption four test just be the test that they apply to what they call involuntary or required submissions. Um, but just last year, the Obama administration tried to get the Ninth Circuit to go the other way and make the test the much more um, un FOIA unfriendly test uh, that is used for voluntary submissions, which would have been um, really devastating. There's just a ton of information we would no longer get. Um, 
So right. So for voluntary, the test is something like if it's not cust if that entity would not customarily release it to the public, and none of these companies release stuff as a matter of yeah. course to the public. So and that would be the, that would be the whole test. Uh, public Citizen lost the case that established that test, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but we do want to change it. Uh, exemption five. Um, this comes up a lot. Um, these are for communications within the executive branch that um, that you wouldn't get in civil discovery. So attorney, client, and work product uh, documents are exemption five. Deliberative process is a, a huge one. The agency's communications about how they should handle a certain situation, you can't get, though you can get the final one that says, here's how we've decided to handle it. Um, this trips us up a lot, I, though I think it's totally understandable, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of stuff, really interesting stuff that you can't see because it's deliberative. Um, in the FOIA law that was passed a year ago, they cut the deliberative process off at 25 years. It's 25, right? Yep. So um, now you can see deliberative material that is 30 years old. Um, but not the attorney client. Unless they say it's attorney client. <laughs> right. You still, it's not all of Exemption 5 that now is a 25 year cutoff, just the deliberative material. Um, once the agency sends deliberative material outside the government, it's no longer covered. They sort of that, because it would no longer be privileged, just like in litigation. If you share it with a third party, you've broken the privilege. But that do, HHS can share something with EPA that doesn't break the privilege. But if they send it to uh, an insurance company to, for some reason, um, then it would no longer be covered. Can you give us any guidance on the deliberative and, and how it gets misused and how we could counter the misuse of it? Um, well, let's show you some, tell you some more specifically what they would be. So an advisory opinion, uh, an opinion from OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel, we can never get them unless they, although um, CREW has been trying to, the uh, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, um, emails debating things, drafts, you never see drafts. Um, um, the last one's sort of the same. Yeah, it's sort of the same. Um, we sometimes challenge Exemption 5 because, we, because of who they've shared it with. Sometimes the question is whether the, an outside person was really working more as a contractor or more independently. We, thought about that just recently. Um, a factual point, not a legal point. Um, you can so, sometimes when the, um, it was a recommendation, but now it's been adopted as the agency's position, they're supposed to give it to you then. then or they're not supposed to claim exemption five then, and sometimes they do anyway. And we've argued with them, with agencies about that from time to time, and successfully from time to time. What were you gonna say? Um, if it's purely factual information, they, it's not deliberative, so that's one way to get pieces of it is to argue, you don't know, you have data in there, and the data is not yeah, that the test results. Lot. They'll say no because the memo has a recommendation in it, but first it has two lengthy paragraphs just setting out the facts. They're supposed to give you every piece of it that is not exempt, so you wouldn't be able to see the recommendation at the bottom, but you should be able to see the facts before the analysis. Um, so here's an example that shows how they gave us all the non-segregable pieces. <laughs> <laughs> this is, when you ask for emails, this is often what it looks like. Yeah. And it's just hard to argue against it. I mean, you can try to push back and try to get them to segregate a little bit more, which is kind of the best you can get a lot of times. Uh, this is just to t kind of give you some context that this is what the policy behind Exemption 5 is that if we were, they were to release it, it would chill their decision making, they wouldn't have this candid discussion about the deliberative process and they don't want to be operating in a fishbowl. 
right, this was yours. All right, so this is, uh, we're moving on to exemption six, and I just thought this was a humorous way of redacting under exemption six. Someone requested these photos from, I think it was an FBI holiday party, and they got the photos and all the heads were redacted. <laughs> but that sums up exemption six, which is personal information that would identify you. Um, so exemption six is a balancing test, and this is uh, unique among the exemptions. Um, none, in, none of the other exemptions does it matter why you would want the information or why, why it would be of interest. Um, there was a brief period where um, a judge in DC had held that the public interest balanced against confidentiality for exemption four. Um, so we won that case, and I think about eight years later, the D.C. Circuit said no. And it probably is correct that on the face of the statute, there wouldn't be a balancing for Exemption 4. But under Exemption 6, there is. Um, so the, the courts say, what's the private interest and what's the public interest? And then they balance them. Um, it's usually not that hard to say what they both are. And... Um, Generally, everybody agrees on what they are on both sides, but then we say it balances this way, and they say it balances that way. Um, the only tricky part is the public interest has to be a public interest in uh, how disclosing this information would show what the agencies are up to. So it's not a public interest. It's not public interest as in like how would it benefit the public. It's how would it show what the agencies are up to. Uh, which also means it's not your personal interest. Uh, so sometimes people ask for information to help them in, in, in their personal litigation, sometimes like in a 1983 case. Um, that's not that helpful in the Exemption 6 because why they want the information might relate to how they personally were treated, but in order to argue for it, they have to explain why the information would, knowing the information would benefit the public generally. Uh, so here's some of the things that are covered by Exemption 6. Um, people who submit comments to the government, that's not private. Um, the names of FOIA requesters is not private. You can request FOIA requests. Um, though we do have a, a working on something for someone who asked the IRS for um, FOIA requests from people who requested information that was not about themselves personally. And the IRS has denied it and said that, uh, what, that the request is exempt under the Exemption 3 statute that says that the IRS doesn't have to give out any information about any return information. So we're not exactly sure what they mean, but it is true that everyone who submits a FOIA request also has submitted a tax return. <laughs> and so by that standard, any request about anything would relate to a, a, someone who filed a tax return. <laughs> um, the address of the farmers who receive subsidies. The federal employees, that, that kind of, I feel like, goes back. I'm not, it's not always. Sometimes they release them and sometimes they don't. They used to always release them, and they stopped during the Obama administration. Although not always, sometimes on the emails. Yeah, sometimes the on the email they show it, and sometimes they not. aren't. Yeah. Um, so exemption seven is a complicated one because it has um, six parts actually. Um, what they have in common is that the records were compiled for law enforcement purposes. Um, some of the Subparts are specifically about ongoing investigations. Um, some are about the procedures they use in investigating. What else do we want to say about this one? Yeah, privacy. I mean, the, the threshold is compiled for law enforcement purposes. And if, if your record is a law enforcement record, it's hard to get, regardless of these other little categories. Rachel mentioned earlier that one of the two exemptions that's used the most is 7C. That is also privacy. Um, and if it's anything that's exempt under 7C would also be exempt under 6. Um, but 7C is more stringent. So if it falls under 7C, um, it's a tougher standard to get it. Right. It's easy. It, the government has an easier time withholding information under 7C than exemption 6. 
And the other one that they use a lot is 7E, which is law enforcement techniques and procedures or guidelines. Okay, so we skipped eight and nine. Eight has to do with banking, and it's really broad. And nine has to do with oil wells. Or water wells. And that's all we know about it. Oh, any well. <laughs> <laughs> Stairwells. <laughs> um, so what FOIA talks about is getting agency records. And a question that arose over the past few years um, that did not arise before then, and we do um, miss the Obama administration desperately, but they were horrible on FOIA. Um, they started playing around with the definition of record. Um, so one thing they started doing was redacting a whole, both small and large pieces of information from otherwise uh, responsive records and just saying on there non-responsive. But because FOIA, re so when you, when you request something, you request the record, you don't ask for the sentence in the record that's responsive. So they're supposed to give you everything in the responsive record that's not exempt. And they started writing non-responsive. Not just to us, but we, um, this was in a, this came up in response to a request that we were litigating anyway. And so we pursued that and the DC Circuit said no. If, you, if the record is responsive, give them everything. There's no such thing as a non-responsive piece of information in a responsive record. That said, the agency can define the word record. So the Office of Information uh, Policy then issued guidance to the federal government about what record was. And basically they've told them you can make record as narrow as you want. You can make record, you can say that every word in this document is a record. Um, what they had done in our case was they had used non-responsive, so there was, there was a chain of emails, and when you re the way it worked was that when someone pressed reply, it included the old email below, so you wound up with a long chain. And so they were saying, well, some of this is non-responsive, like in this chain, somebody m might have started talking about their dinner reservation. So it's not like we wanted it, but it wasn't, if it's not exempt, then we should have gotten it. But one reason it was really dangerous is because, as it turned out, we could tell after they started giving us some of it after they lost on this issue in the DC Circuit, was they had actually used this to redact information that was incredibly responsive. Um, and, but we couldn't test it. It wasn't subject to an exemption, so we, weren't, we wouldn't have been litigating about it if, if redactions of non-responsive material had been permitted. But at least at that time, the, it, was not, it was not permitted according to the DC Circuit, and so we were able to get the information that they had previously taken out with that notation. But under the OIP guidance, now they can do this going forward um, because they just have redefined record in a way that lets them do pretty broad redactions and here's one. So here's a record that was responsive, supposedly, and non-exempt. So it's hard to imagine what was responsive about the record if the entire content of it is non-responsive. So this was before the case that Allison just mentioned, the AILA case. And then after the AILA case, this FOIA requester asked that it be reprocessed and so then, I don't know if you can read this, but what it says at the top is record one, non-responsive. Then the second block says record two, non-responsive. So they've just said that this one document consists of a whole series of records, and most of the records within this document are non-responsive. So the, the, what the guidance does is it says you can define a record. <coughs> Don't define a record until you get the request. And once you get the request and the subject matter of that request, then you define the record, which is a huge problem <laughs> because it means what they're saying is if you are requesting complaints about immigration judges and you ask for a specific judge, then on that you have, let's say, a page that lists 20 immigration judges. This is an example they give in the guidance. 
lists 20, the names of 20 immigration judges. Only one of them is the one that this request seeks. Each of the names can be defined as a separate record. Each of those other records is not responsive to your request. So we will just give you the one name on that page that you asked for. Under, before this guidance came out, you would have gotten that whole page because that's a record, right? It's a unit. Question, is there any later like, legal challenge to their redefinition of record? Um, the, the group that had this request, I believe, is litigating it. Yeah, they are litigating it. Um, I think they faced some other hurdles because the, after this, the agency actually, I think they didn't want to have, be litigating the guidance. So they then reprocessed this again and applied an actual exemption to all the information. And so they're saying it's moot. And I don't know what's happened with that. It's that summary judgment. It will be, though. And there's no way they can justify this. I don't think any of the three judges on the panel that said agency can define record had this in mind. I, what had happened at oral argument in that case was Judge Srinivasan was really concerned about the fact that about people who just have the reply, the, the original message with the reply, and that some people just have chains of emails that could go on for days. And I remember at oral argument, our colleague's response was, well, they set up their email program that way. They, you, can, you don't have to set up your email program that way, but if they did, it's one record. But he was re that was what he was really concerned about. So I wasn't that sympathetic to him, but to his point there, but you can see that at least it, a discrete email, maybe, that, and I think that's what they had in mind when they wrote that the agency could define a record, not that they could say each sentence was a different record. Yeah, I think it really was just an, an issue of the email thread that keeps going and has many topics. Yeah, I think we got an insight into how he emails. <laughs> <laughs> so, a question? So when there's a redaction, um, can the judge access the information to decide whether or not it's um, like it's if if FOIA could like um, not provide that information? A judge can ask for in camera review, and occasionally the government will suggest it. Occasionally the plaintiff will suggest it. It's pretty uncommon, um, but it has happened. And, um, we had an exemption four case where. Um, the judge eventually looked at the stuff and said, no, it's not confidential. <laughs> um, oh, this was a example of one of the um, silly things that they've been doing recently. So when we asked for a fee waiver request, um, on the basis that we're non-commercial, we're using it to inform the public, and that we have a record of using the information we get to inform the public. Um, this was a, the request we made was not particularly broad at all. Actually, it was narrow. Um, but we got an email back saying they couldn't decide whether to grant our fee waiver request because some of the information that might be responsive might be innocuous, and so it wouldn't be that valuable in informing the public. Um, so in response to this, <coughs> we wound up writing, I think, three-page single-space letter or something. It was just a total waste of time. The law is clear that the fee waiver request is determined on the face of the request. So the agency is supposed to determine the fee waiver right from the start, and that makes sense because if they deny your fee waiver, you might say, then I have to withdraw the request because I can't afford it. Um, so they're supposed to decide right at the beginning. And that's not um, an open question in the law. So this was just a way of them jerking us around and making us spend a couple hours writing a letter citing cases that made clear that they decided the basis of the request. Um, we're done? Yeah. Okay, well. Something else we wanted to mention, um, just to keep in mind, is you don't have to keep pursuing a FOIA request. I think we sort of mentioned this, but we had requested um, 
records of communications between some of the appointees and the agencies prior to them being appointed. So, for example, um, Andy Puzder, Andrew Puzder, is that right? Labor, was that right? Yeah, something like that. Um, but he, of course, didn't end up being appointed, and they said, like, do you want to keep following up with this request? And we dropped it, even though you can. So it's just, you don't have to keep pursuing it just for the heck of it. Uh, so we thought that to make this more concrete, we could talk about some of the um, specific pieces of information that people have asked us recently uh, if we could FOIA for um, and talk through with you whether those were good ideas or what we might expect and also to hear from you about things that you might wish you could get and we could talk as a group about whether that is something you could ask for and what you might get in return. Um, do we have the same list? No. Right, you go first. <laughs> um, if you wanted to ask for, let's say, advice or opinions that the Office of Government Ethics gave on conflicts of interest for those coming into the new administration, what do you guys think would be some of the hurdles, exemptions? Do you think you could get it? No. Nope. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, if you wanted to find out it, any kind of advice or opinions that the Office of Government Ethics gave on conflicts of interest, say, with Jared Kushner's holdings or anything like that, anyone in the in, incoming administration. Would they try to claim that it's deliberative? I think that's probably a, a big one, yeah. <laughs> Attorney client. For financial information, probably, yeah, definitely. Um, well, speaking of Jared Kushner, we had read um, an article that said that he had commissioned CEOs from Dow Chemical, Walmart, GM, and IBM to help fill some of the 5,000 vacant government jobs with public-private partnerships to create job training programs that will serve as pipelines for those roles. Um, does that suggest any FOIA requests and any successful ones? or? Any ideas? Wait. Well, he's he's technically part of, he's not part of an agency. He's an appointee, or he's part of the, the president's cabinet, right? So I don't know. You said earlier that the, the president doesn't fall under FOIA. So I don't know which agency you would request that from. So we've had that. Um, that problem that you're, identif that you're correctly identifying uh, several times where the, there are a bunch of um, uh, CEOs and other extremely rich people um, that are advising the White House um, or agencies and we're not quite sure how to find out more about it. Um, their communications with Trump himself we can't get um, but if we look at some of them, like um, if it's Dow and GM, then we might be able to FOIA for communications between um, the CEO of Dow and EPA or the CEO of GM and the Department of Transportation. Um, if we don't limit it in time, uh, that would be a monster request for them, I assume. Um, but we're obviously just asking for February to the data processing or something like that. So we're not going to actually hear about Jared Kushner's response because he is within the executive office of the president. Um, but uh, we have sent some requests into the particular agencies about their communications with some of the people that uh, seem to be advising. Um, because if they're advising the White House about, say, environmental policy, they're probably talking to the EPA as well, for example. Yeah, and one, one of the challenges, the other challenges that comes up with that is figuring out which offices within the department to, also, to FOIA, because a lot of times they break it down. You have to specify office of the secretary. I don't know, does the CEO communicate with the office of the secretary, the office of you know, policy, or are they talking to some assistant secretary? 
it's I think that part is hard too. And I end up for some of those I ended up sending in a lot of FOIA requests to within the same agency, but to different offices. There was um, there was a a lot of articles in the news of. Uh, six or eight weeks ago, about how Carl Icahn was suggesting in his role as advisor to the president some changes with respect to the biofuel program, and that was also going to personally benefit him. So his communications with the president weren't foiable, but supposedly he'd been lobbying the agency last year, last summer, on the same matter. So in order, t so the people in our office who are interested in researching and informing the public about issues related to government ethics and, and uh, conflicts, they were interested in seeing what exactly had Carl Icahn been, what position was he taking before the agency on this same matter over the past eight months and how that related to what he was now telling the Trump to do so that we could explore the nature of the relationship and of the conflict. Um, one that I that I saw recently that had been submitted that some people might be interested in was um, they sent a request to OMB. I'm not sure why OMB, but they sent it to OMB for um, the tweets and deleted and not deleted for a time frame from at real Donald Trump and at POTUS, um, and OMB's response was that these are not agency records because they don't own the Twitter account. So they got nothing. Who, who I guess the, I don't know who, who technically is registered, but I, I guess if it's, since it's not registered to the government or it's only registered to the president. Uh, Sean Spicer said this week that that his tweets were government records, um, but they're not government records held by the government. Right. I guess you could consider it comparable to a private email account where if they're using it for private business, it's still a federal record, but uh, they don't actually own the, and they can edit it, they can delete things, they can add things, but they don't actually control the system. Um, what's another example? So another one um, that comes up a bit is getting the costs of travel to, say, Mar-a-Lago, um, or how much that trip in general is costing uh, the government and um, so you can get Air Force. You can submit FOIA requests to the Air Force, and they have they will tell you how much. I think it's they give you an hourly rate for the flight, uh, which is something like one hundred forty four thousand or something like that. Um, and they can there's also some form, but if you just request um, all records of transportation costs, they give you this hand filled out form. It it lists the crew members, which they redact. And then a bunch of information on, I think it's fuel or something like that, something about the trip. Um, so you can get that, which gives you the Air Force costs. Um, I know we're trying to get some from the Secret Service. I don't know if we've gotten anything. We haven't. No. The Secret Service is overwhelmed by requests, is my feeling. <laughs> yeah. So recently you may have read that the... Um, White House visitor logs are, um, they're not foyable from the White House because you can't FOIA the White House and because the ACLU lost a case about that uh, in the past few years. But the Obama administration was releasing the, vid the visitor logs anyway and the Trump administration isn't. Um, um, s some groups have FOIA the FOIA agencies for visitor logs, there are parts of the White House that are, um, that are FOIAble and parts that aren't. Um, so, um, for instance, OMB is within the Executive Office of the President, but it's actually a FOIAble agency. Um, so, we send in requests, and if you go into to the 
website for the executive office of the president, it actually lists the sub offices and tells you which ones are subject to FOIA and which ones aren't. So we FOIA the ones that are subject to FOIA and then we also FOIA the Secret Service for the visitor logs for those subparts. Um, the, we've gotten a couple responses from the individual offices saying they don't have them, which made us think the Secret Service must have them. But then we got a response from the Secret Service just recently saying that they don't have to respond to us. Um, someone in my office who doesn't actually like to do FOIA litigation, she did it for a long time and said she'd had enough. She was just so outraged by this that when I told her she could give it to someone else because she had sent in the request, she just couldn't help herself and she wrote this long appeal letter and she said she wanted to keep the whole thing. She was just so pissed about it. <laughs> um, so anyway, I can tell you next year how that turned out. <laughs> what else you got? Um, another one we did was uh, communications between Jay Clayton and the SEC prior to his becoming chairman of the SEC because he had, uh, I think he represented Goldman Sachs in a lot of IPOs and we were curious about those communications. And what we got back were a lot of emails that were redacted under Exemption 5. Um, so we had asked for these from prior to January 20th or so. Um, so does anyone know why that was, what they would be claiming under Exemption 5? Okay, so what they were saying was it's uh, attorney-client because they were there was an attorney at the government who was advising him on his vet being vetted for this position. I thought we were avoiding Exemption 5 by asking for um, communications with Jay Clayton. And then I wasn't sure if that would count as privileged. Uh, I think we decided we weren't that interested in it, but um, <laughs> it did raise an interesting question because I thought I was being tricky in getting around deliberative process and they were saying it was privileged attorney-client information because they were vetting him. They also did a lot of exemption six because he didn't disclose financial information about himself. Um, so another series of requests that we've sent in have to do with the president's executive order that says for every one new regulation you have to cut two. Now we've sued about the executive order and we thought it might be useful to see what the agencies um, what what the agencies are saying within internally about how to implement the order. Um, so we have a whole bunch of defendants and we FOIA'd each of those agency defendants uh, for uh, all records concerning implementation of the executive order. Um, so far we've gotten some acknowledgements, some random questions that uh, fall in that category of things done to waste our time, um, but we haven't gotten anything substantive. Um, and that is um, one of the problems with trying to use FOIA in litigation, which um, we actually don't usually do, but I know some trial lawyers sometimes do that, um, and sometimes people try to do it in 1983 litigation. Uh, trial lawyers, I meant like um, product liability cases, for example. Um, because FOIA is not really about a 20-day turnaround and it can take so long, it can, if you didn't send in your FOIA request before you even had a cause of action, you might not, uh, you're unlikely to have it fast enough uh, to use in the litigation. In this case, we'll be interested in the information whenever we get it, um, but it would probably be useful if we had it uh, before the summary judgment briefing. <laughs> Um, I, I actually had a question. Um, could you explain a little bit how FOIA ties in with discovery when you are going into trial, if you just use it as a part of it, or if you could get more um, through discovery than just the FOIA request and how that works? Uh, well, if you were litigating against the government in a case where discovery was permitted, 
it would be faster to seek discovery. Um, if you're litigating a case where the government is not a party, it can be difficult to get third party discovery from the government. There's limits on it and they often fight it, um, even document requests. And so FOIA would then be a reasonable way to try to get the material. The problem is that discovery has deadlines that are enforceable in court and FOIA doesn't. There is a provision in FOIA uh, that allows a requester to ask for expedition, but to, I'm not sure I've ever seen that granted. Um, to get expedition, you have to show an urgent need to inform the public, not an urgent need to use it in litigation. So it's very hard to get them to speed up. Um, if the government doesn't have a personal interest in whatever it is you're seeking, then it may be that they have no reason to try to hold you up and you might get it more timely. Um, there's also, we should mention, everything we've talked about is really about was section A3 of FOIA, but there is an A2, which is about affirmative disclosures, things the agency is supposed to make publicly available proactively without a request. Um, and that's why there is so much information available online. It's not just because they like to keep us informed, but because um, FOIA requires them to. Um, the catch in that otherwise really positive provision is that the DC Circuit recently issued a decision that makes that unenforceable essentially. Um, so if the agency's not posting final opinions online, which it's supposed to do, there's not really much you can do about it. Um, and they're also supposed to post online frequently requested records, which are records that are requested three or more times. Um, that also sounds great, but it's unenforceable. Uh, under the DC Circuit's opinion, the way you'd have to enforce it would be to make a FOIA request, which defeats the whole purpose of saying that they're gonna request, they're gonna post them online. Um, uh, there's another case that recently challenged that in uh, district court in Los Angeles, and the district court decided to follow the DC Circuit uh, we're considering another case on it, which we would probably file in New York. Um, but it may be that re that requires a legislative fix. Um, but I've strayed from your question, which is um, if you can get it through discovery, you'll get it faster. But often you can't. Or in a, in a case like a, a case under the Administrative Procedure Act, you don't get any discovery. So um, you obviously couldn't use it in that situation. Yeah, on that crew, the decision she was just talking about, the, the provision is written, um, A2, the agency is supposed to make it publicly available electronically, uh, which we would like to mean they post it online, in which the DC Circuit has said the courts can only order them to produce it to the person who requested it. So in a lawsuit to enforce A2, they would just send you the record, and y I guess you could post it online, which is what makes it virtually unenforceable. Um, so another thing someone read in the paper, uh, in the newspaper uh, about a month ago and asked us to what we could get was uh, a plan that apparently Scott Pruitt was thinking of replacing government employees with um, private, with non-governmental employees, not internally, but just farming out the work of the EPA to the extent it's still gonna be doing work. Um, uh, so someone in our office was interested in knowing what that plan was and how far along it was. We haven't got anything back yet. Um, there's also another EPA plan to uh, buy out the current staff. Um, uh, offer people early retirement or packages to leave. Um, and um, to the extent that's not deliberative, we're waiting to see if we get something back. We've, there've been a few articles about versions of that plan, so it seems to exist, um, but we haven't seen yet what they're gonna 
what they're going to give us. And I think in that case, it might happen that they wind up doing these buyouts before they give us the information. <laughs> um, so uh, we're interested in hearing what you read in the uh, newspaper or wherever you do your reading in the past week that is, there has to be something that irritated you that, uh, that the government's doing that we might figure out what we could ask for. Hi. Um, so basically the <clears throat> The threshold for freedom of information, like in, in all over the world, but especially where I come from, from Latin America, is that all information is accessible. The only uh, exemption that you will have, a section that you have, is national security. And that's the threshold imposed by the Inter American Court of Human Rights. However, um, how do you think that, e even though that you have that uh, really, that really broad, uh, like you have like really broad spectrum of information of, of, of access to information still for example a, a good investigative journalism is not accessible in in like in Latin American countries uh, how do you think or what's your view on with the current administration or the, or for the future in, in American investigative journalism uh, what, what could be the future under FOIA or under other freedom to information instruments uh, regarding a uh, uh, investigative journalism, how, how, how could it be improved or what, what's the future, what's the current state right now? Um, so I think uh, um, FOIA is still useful for journalists when they're not on deadline. Um, so if you're doing an investigative piece where a journalist is spending a f months tracking something down, then FOIA can be useful. Um, but for it to be super useful, um, I think requires uh, legislative change because it's, um, it's, it's too slow, so it needs more money. Um, the agencies have too much freedom to uh, exempt information, and because they can exempt so much, they do, even though all the exemptions except the national security exemption are waivable. The agency doesn't have to exempt just because it can, but they do, that's their mindset. That also slows things down, right, because the more categories you have to think about exempting, the longer it takes to review the document. Um, um, and they need yeah. a new, they, when you FOIA something and then you talk to the FOIA officer, it sounds like, I don't, I don't know how their record systems are set up, but I don't know, they, they don't seem to be able to search electronically for a huge amount of information. Like for instance, um, someone at the Treasury told me that they can't search by email address. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> like, I wanted emails from this person and they said we can't search by that. And I don't know how they're actually searching, but this is a common problem. They, agencies will tell you they can't search by certain things, they can only search by topic. So it's also the whole way that the information is stored at these agencies is highly inefficient. And then another problem that makes it harder to use, whether for an investigative journalist or a lawyer or anyone else, is that the courts are extremely deferential to the agencies on all the exemptions. So even though FOIA has a built-in presumption in favor of disclosure, and this has been restated over and over again, by the courts, it'll even be stated at the beginning of a decision where the judge then totally gives the benefit of the doubt to the agency. Um, this just the emboldens, the, it reaffirms the agency's decisions and DOJ's decision in defending them um, to just try to slow things down and to withhold information because the courts are just not holding them to the statutory standard. Um, Another related problem we've seen in litigation is that although the burden is on the agency, you have cross motions for summary judgment, if they don't carry their burden, the court will say, um, you know, the Department of Commerce hasn't carried its burden, I want new motions for summary judgment. And they give them a second chance or a third chance, which they would never do, right, if the burden was on the private party, they would just say you lose. Um, but if the courts aren't willing to really hold them to the 
statutory standard, and the statute has so many exemptions that have, although the, again, the courts say they're interpreted narrowly, in fact, they're, many of them are interpreted broadly, the value of the tool is certainly diminished. It's not um, unuseful, that's why we're talking to you about it and we still use it, but it's not, it's only a part of what it should be. And just to get back to your question, I do think that journalists use state and local public records ones pretty successfully. A lot of those have faster turnaround times and you can see them using those to use, you know, they can actually do it a piece pretty quickly. How you doing? I was uh, gonna ask about surveillance of protesters. I know a while back there was a report that DHS and other agencies had surveilled protesters in Baltimore, and I think it was Color of Change that filed uh, a FOIA request lawsuit. I don't know what sort of uh, uh, complications or concerns you may anticipate that may revolve around that, and do you have any strategies if someone wanted to uh, follow up on that? Does anyone have any thoughts on what exemptions that requester might run into? Yes, yeah, so the exemption seven exemptions are gonna be the, the problem there. If there was a, um, the, the, surely the person could say you can, that could agree that they're not looking for the names of any individuals, they could be looking for the policy or they could be looking for the materials that reflect the surveillance with the names of individual people redacted. Um, but the agency is likely to say that it would reveal um, our law enforcement methods or this is part of an ongoing investigation um, and a court would be unlikely to push them. You'd need a pretty um, sympathetic judge. Um, the, the agency could just give it to them though. I mean, one thing is that we tend to be sort of conservative if there's someone asks me for something that I think is exempt, I want to say we're not gonna do that, it's exempt. But um, sometimes when you ask, you get it anyway. So the ACLU had a big litigation about terrorism related materials that I would have just said if my boss had asked me to do it, like, no. Like, they weren't entitled to any of that. But they had this big litigation and the agency kept just giving them stuff during the course of the litigation. It was totally worth it. So sometimes, even if you think what you're asking for, something you might not get, you just never know what they'll give you. So. Yeah. You can also, sometimes you can try to think of other stuff. So for example, talking points from the press office, you can sometimes get that on an issue and it's not gonna be exactly what you want, but if you know it's an issue they might have to be responding to press about, you can get the memo that was passed around for how to talk to the press. And once you get it, it might lead you to think of some other discrete category of documents that are related. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so I know most of the requests come out of the DC circuit. I mean, most of the litigation comes from there, but have you seen any sort of novel opinions or anything from other circuits where they don't necessarily just follow what DC has been doing? Where they don't follow DC? So the Ninth Circuit used to have a different summary judgment standard that they've now switched. That was kind of the big one. Um, I don't think they have any major things that are different. There's a lot of issues that the DC Circuit has addressed that the others haven't. Um, and we are seeing a little more FOIL litigation uh, in the Second Circuit or in the Ninth Circuit. Um, you know, f for a while, for all sorts of government-related litigation, we were all trying to find uh, clients that would have a basis for suing outside of DC. Um, and in many, for many types of litigation, that switched. But not so much for FOIA, because in DC they get so much FOIA litigation that I think the judges think of it as nuisance litigation, even though we think government transparency is super important. So, even if the judges are otherwise open-minded, I think they just have a, they see FOIA and 
it's sort of the way I feel when someone says FERC, like I just want to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question back there. So while um, state and local public records laws might be faster, some of them seem more restrictive than FOIA. And so I was wondering to the extent that a federal agency might have information that from the state level that might not be available under the state public records law, would that be FOIAble if the federal agency had that information? Right, yeah, so if, the, if a federal agency has the record, it's in the, so the test for agency record is, is it was it created or obtained by the agency and did they have control over it? Then it's an agency re record and they can, it's subject to federal FOIA exemptions, but not the state ones. There was a question over here. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little about the appeal process after you get the rejection and before you go to courts. Uh, like what, what happens in between and any suggestions you have on how to go through the process? So the regular, in the initial process, you're dealing with uh, um, the many people in the staff in the FOIA office. Um, once you get to the appeal process, they deny it, you write a letter, it's going to be um, a more substantive letter than the one than your request letter. Uh, because in the request letter, you probably didn't say anything about why you were entitled to it, and now you have to explain it. Um, the denial letter, whether it's partial or um, entire, is going to cite exemptions, so now you know what you're up against. So your appeal letter will focus on why they're wrong to say that exemption four applies or why they're wrong that exemption five applies or why the public interest outweighs any privacy interest under exemption six. Um, so your, the letter will take longer and, and be more argumentative than your request. Um, the appellate, the, the, the internal agency people handling the appeals, um, there are fewer of them and they're, um, they should have more experience. And so sometimes they are able to override the people that came below. Um, from our side though, there's, there's not that much different that's going on. Um, we're sending in a, re a letter and then we're sitting around waiting. And it is harder to get information at the appeal stage about when you're gonna hear back. Um, I don't even know if they have a first in, first out for appeals. I don't know either. Um, at FDA, for example, they've got something like 99 FOIA staff who do the initial requests, and they have one guy, or it might be a woman now, who does the appeals. So that one person knows a lot about FOIA, but they're pretty backed up um, and not that sympathetic. <laughs> Um, I have had, uh, just actually with FDA, I've had um, the person call me to try to talk me down or to try to come up with a compromise. I think that is because of public citizens' relationship with FDA, because um, we have a whole uh, group of people who just focus on the FDA and have been foying them since 1972. Um, so I, I don't, I think, I expect that's why that's happened and it hasn't happened with other agencies. Um, but generally process-wise, it seems similar. More is required of you and you should get a slightly, you should get a more substantive letter back. Although I was gonna say on that, I think that the part of the appeal that's hard is that the letter, the denial letter is often very not, it's not substantive enough. So they will tell you, they're supposed to tell you the volume of records that they have withheld and then the exemptions. Um, and then they usually just quote kind of their regulation or the statutory language for the exemption and that's why they've withheld it. But you have nothing to go off of because you don't know what it's been withheld. So your letter is a lot of speculation or like looking at the context, you know, we expect that this would have this type of information and this would not be exempt. Yeah, someone 
reached out to us uh, two weeks ago f after he'd gotten a denial, and it had, and the denial had just said exemption five dash eighty seven pages, <laughs> exemption six dash twenty four pages, <laughs> and there was a third one, and then the next sheet was just something they must attach to all of them that just listed each exemption, and then had you know a one to four word summary of what it meant, <laughs> so. For his appeal, he's totally guessing about what they might have in mind. What agency was that? Do you remember? OSHA. <laughs> um, yeah, it was hard to give him advice. I also didn't really understand his question. But um, Any other questions? Oh, thank you. How much of the issue do you think could be solved by just uh, giving more funding, obviously there's an issue with, you know, certain exemptions are too broad, but a lot of it is just because of how overwhelmed these agencies are with requests. How much of the, of the problem do you think could be solved by just more staffing and more funding for agencies to, you know, just hire people who only deal with FOIA requests? I think that could be very useful. It wouldn't solve all the problems, but it would be very useful. It should certainly cut down on the lag times. Um, and that is a, that's a big um, problem with using FOIA for anything, um, whether it's a, a journalist or an advocate or a litigator, the lag time is, it just makes it so much less useful than it would otherwise be, so more staff would certainly help with that. Um, I think the biggest thing that would help but will never change is if the agency mindset changed. I know there are people who a couple of people who came out of the Obama administration and joked to me about how they would try to convince the FOIA officer to withhold information. So the FOIA person actually wanted, agreed it wasn't exempt, but then the staff whose substantive work it was just didn't want to share it. And that pro I don't know who would win those in the end, but it's a waste of time and it's like contrary to the whole idea of openness we once had someone at the Department of State say to my colleague, how would you feel if someone came to your house and looked through your drawers? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> she then suggested that because the information my colleague was seeking related to something the Chamber of Commerce had done with the State Department, that public citizen just called the Chamber of Commerce and asked for it. <laughs> like, but. <laughs> so does that mean that the, the staff member at the agency is given notice that their email, every time that one of their emails or communications or memos is subject to a FOIA request that they get notice of that? Yeah, so I send the request into the FOIA office and then the FOIA office determines that these eight people may have responsive documents. So they ask those uh, people to send us what you have. Got it. And then those people apparently try to talk the FOIA people into not giving it to me. And I think one thing that would help also, it seems pretty basic to me, but um, would just be to have it more transparent. If you could look up, well, these are the FOIA requests that have been submitted, it, like very timely. This person has asked for this information and this is the stuff they've gotten so far. Just make it more proactively disclosed for any request. Don't wait for three requests, just disclose it more promptly. And you can then, you wouldn't be repeating the same requests. I imagine they get a lot of the same requests or they overlap and it's just very inefficient that way. Um, someone pointed out to us recently that the Department of Education was not posting online its frequently requested records. He'd sent in a FOIA request to find that out. Um, so that's actually, that makes no sense for them because they've already three times or more disclose this information and instead of now just posting it online so they don't have to deal with it anymore, deal with any more requests, they're gonna keep receiving and processing FOIA requests. So if they could actually comply with the affirmative disclosure requirement, they might have less work. We have like uh, seven minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Anything you wanna FOIA? No, thank you. Thanks.